Seagram building was designed by architect Ludwig Mies van der Roche and Philip Johnson. It's made in New York City from 1954 to 1958 out of steel frame with glass, curtain, wall, and bronze. The context is the Seagram family was a company in Canada that thrived during the 1920s when the United States um, forbade the sale of alcohol during the Prohibition era. The Seagram family was um, being br brought in by through the northern border and people were going across the border to Canada to drink and they made lots of money. So they were able to build the most expensive building in the world in New York City from the sale of alcohol. More context is they designed it in the international style, which was very popular at the time. It would remain popular up through the 1970s. And that international style we've seen before on this Villa Savoy, where they reject ornamentation, they um, require kind of um, repetitive forms that can be made pretty easily in industry. They have flat surfaces with areas of glass interspersed, and it's volume, so kind of size of the building versus the mass, you know, so it's not like a shark cathedral here. Then they use glass, steel, and concrete rather than brick and stone. Okay, the form of this we've seen in the Carson Perry or Pyrie Scott building in Chicago that this is a tripartite design where there are three parts to the building. There's this lobby area, which when lit up, you can kind of see through here. Then there is this whole office building area or office floors area that is all the same. And then at the top, there is a design that kind of says, hey, I'm the top of the building. This is a building that's designed with the concept of less is more. Make it simple, minimalist, and it will look beautiful. It is made to look sleek. There's no brick, no heavy stone. So very straightforward design. Just want to point out that I'm teaching my kids about the building here, and they're kind of over here ignoring me. <laughs> My son said, no, we were probably talking about the building. I don't know. Okay, in terms of form, what makes this very expensive is that the Seagram family wanted to use bronze. And so there's 1,500 tons of bronze on this building. The bronze, though, is not integral to the structure of the building. It is kind of the pretty outside. So... If I can point it out, do you see this is the letter I? This is an I beam. And that I beam is kind of stuck to the outside. It goes all the way up the building and it makes it look like the building. It's the skeleton, the exoskeleton of the building. But the truth is that behind these I beams running up, there's a lot of concrete and steel in behind the window. And you can see this here. This is a front-on photograph um, of the building's side. So I know this doesn't look bronze, but this is an I-beam. And behind it, you can see this kind of concrete here. And that's filled. It's got a steel beam in it, and that's what's holding the building up. So it looks like this. See those posts? That's steel. And down here, they've started covering it with concrete. And then down here, they're starting to put on that exoskeleton outside bronze I-beams that don't, that don't hold the building up, but that give it the cool look. So this is a revolutionary building for its time. Look around it. There is you know, very few, uh, or are very few tall buildings. This is the Empire State Building over here, I think. I should think about that. Um, content, this is, this is what makes this an another part of it, other than being a sleek international style, is that the 
building architects and owners decided to leave this very expensive real estate uncovered. So it's a plaza. Look at all these people sitting here having lunch. There are sociology experiments being that have been done that you could look up about this plaza and the behavior of people here. Um, and then in the summer, you can see there are two big fountains. And in the winter, they fill the fountains in with Christmas trees. And here we are. Um, by setting back the building from the sidewalk, they allow more light to le reach down into, you know, these trees here and um, just kind of bring more of an openness to the city. So this was transformative in building code. If a building owner would set back their building, they were allowed to go higher. So look at all these buildings here that have been since built. They're not they're not following the Seagram design. They are taking advantage of every inch of real estate on the ground. Do you see that? Now building code requires that as they get up higher that they have to become narrower at the top to still allow light in. But these other building designers are going right to the edge of their sidewalks. Whereas this, I mean, this is marble here that these people are sitting on. And this is a, I think it's a granite um, plaza space. So this is really unique. Looks cool. And this is an example of a building stepping back but, you know, down at the bottom where it's it's biggest, it's taking advantage of every inch of real estate. OK, so take see that in situ in place. It's kind of cool sitting back like that. This is a winter picture. You can see the trees in the fountains. So the function of the Seagram building, it is one of the first skyscrapers in the United States, setting an example for how to build tall buildings. It is. Um, a prime example also of the international style, that sleek concrete steel and glass design building. And I want to just also point out, which I think is just a totally cool uh, anal, but I love it um, feature. And that is that all of the windows employ these um, screens that are allowed to be completely down all the way up or halfway up. There's no, like you can't just like adjust it however you want. That way there's more uniformity in the building's looks. Love it. So this is the Seagram building done by the architects Ludwig Mies van der Roche and Philip Johnson in New York City, 1954 to 58, out of steel with glass wall, a glass wall and bronze.